he wrote this. And he wrote this. Good afternoon, Bob Geldof, XFM 4 to 6. Today's a pretty good start to the week. We have someone here whom I have very little in common with, except today we both have blocked ears. Um, Brian, e- Brian Eno. Hello, hello, hello. <laughs> Thanks for coming in. Um, Brian, uh, the reason I blocked ears is as I've just come on a flight from Ireland, and... Um, You've you've got a problem with Ireland. You never get a hard on when you're there. Um, <laughs> it's true. I don't know why that is, really. Well, you actually it's wrote not about because, it. Well, it's not because the women aren't beautiful, because they are. Oh. It's just because I have other things on my mind, you know. But you always have other things on your mind. I mean, you think too much. I mean, you're the most <laughs> rational, organised brain I've, I've ever <laughs> encountered, certainly in book form. Well, I wouldn't say that, Bob. <laughs> You're talking about my diary, I guess. I, I am, but in general, anyway, I mean, when we've chatted or in conversations I've overheard, I've been mean, party to. Um, in fact, you know, the last person we had in was Shane McGowan, whose mm-hmm. brain is willfully chaotic. <laughs> in fact, he, he goes about, you know, dissembling, or not dissembling, disassembling his brain <laughs> and with the various uh, potions. Uh, and and great fa- success, yeah. I must say. Um, but he arrives at the same conclusion you do, usually <laughs> musically, because, you know, you've got a very organised thought pattern. In fact, people pay you to organise their musical thoughts. And I thought it's, it's pretty weird that pop music can encompass more or less the whole spectrum of mental mm. disorders. Well, <laughs> you mean including my yes. <laughs> mine being an extreme version of the mental disorder. Yeah. Well, it's funny how um, the ends of a spectrum often do meet, like uh, Shane and I probably have ended up at pretty much the same place, just like radical um, conservatives and radical anarchists often end up agreeing about things. You know, I think we, you know, when the two ends of the spectrum come round again like that, and neither of you can get an erection in Ireland. <laughs> well, can Shane? I don't know. I don't know. I've, I've never asked him about that. Given his condition, it's a moot point. But uh, <laughs> Except you did when you went nude swimming. Yes, I did. And if was, I remember some... in, the, in the bon mot, it was like exercising an unused muscle. <laughs> well, it, unused in Ireland, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think it's the combination of the Holy Mother Church breathing down my neck, because, you know, I grew up a Catholic. I, I think that might have an effect suffusing the Irish atmosphere like that. What did it bring to you, that um, Catholic uh, education? Um, well, guilt is the, is the main thing it's you get a very from good a Catholic thing education. I love it. It's not a bad thing. No. Yeah. yeah, guilt translates into the feeling of, I ought to be doing other than I'm doing now, or better than I'm doing now, I guess. Well, that's always sort of pursued you, hasn't it? I mean, mm-hmm. is that that constant? Is that that... Um, I'm going to use the word willful, but you never, you never stop in one place. I mean, you're just back from St. Petersburg and you're off somewhere else and you keep moving around, I mean, musically as well as physically. Mm-hmm. Why? Um, I, I can't do anything twice. It's not because I'm too noble to do anything twice. I can't ever remember how to do it again. You know, the way things come into being is usually so complicated that if you actually try to repeat it, you realise you're not capable of repeating it, so you end up thinking, well, I'll do something else anyway. Do you not think some of your records, though, have been... um Highly repetitive. (laughs) (laughs) Well, in fact, discrete music, I mean, you've actually said, which was the the first ambient record ever, Mm. um, you know, you invented this genre, and for God's sake, and you put it back in that box. (laughs) Um, But, uh, you know, that was it, wasn't it? It was a series, it was a repetitious noise that would be endless, wasn't that the point? That was the idea, yeah. I made it as long as you could make a record at the time. It was 32 minutes, I think, on one side of of the album. And if I could have made it eight hours long, I would have done. So the idea was to make a music that existed like a painting. You know, paintings don't have duration. You know, you don't switch them on and then they last for four minutes and 17 seconds and fade out. But they do have parameters. They do have the edge of the frame. Well, this this has a parameter in that um, it has a volume control, you know. So you, you have control over its most important parameter, which is whether it's there or not. And, and yeah. I, I, thought, I liked the idea of making a music that people could use like they would use light in a room. You know, nobody has any objection to switching a light on and off and, and realising that you shape your environment with light in that way. 
Why do you think ambient became um, one of the if you like, mainstream types of music available today and in clubs? I mean, entire clubs, entire raves given over to something that, in effect, you created. The right drug came along or what? <laughs> that, that always People helps. Fell <laughs> 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 that always helps that the right drug comes along but also i think um i think things always create their opposites you know and the the, the birth of techno and of you know hyper dense very fast music music that was absolutely packed with action sort of created a taste for the exact opposite which was music that was very open and that allowed you a lot of space inside it people get a sort of very spiritual Thing out of ambient music. A friend of mine who's an ex-monk and now a TV producer views it as the new Gregorian chant, for example. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything in that? Is there a sort of inherent uh, spirituality in that particular type of club music that may not exist in techno? Um, well, I'm, I'm always nervous about the word spirituality, but... That's because you're a Catholic. <laughs> That's because I'm... It's, it's all right to grow definitely up. Definitely not it's a all Catholic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose it's, it's um, still pushing that bank away from me. But um, no, I, th I think the aspect of it that you could call spiritual is the feeling that uh, you want to occupy a different kind of space than your life regularly offers you, you know. And that space might be called meditative or thoughtful or contemplative. It's it's not a space that one is very much encouraged to occupy. I remember when when I made that record, Discreet Music, I thought this is the kind of music I'd like to hear in a supermarket. So I took it to my local supermarket. I knew the manager there, and I said, "Why don't you put this on for a week and see what it does?" So I went back after a week and I said, "How did it do?" He said, "Well." Everyone stayed in the shop a lot longer, but bought much less. <laughs> Success. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> yes, I thought it was a real blow for anti-consumerism, but, but he didn't. And uh, I think in general, you know, the, the way to stimulate buying patterns in general is by speed and energy. So to make, to make a music that plays on the two opposite things, um, slowness and tranquility, is in some sense um, uh, a countercultural thing to do, I think. Um, indication of your restless mind. We started off this afternoon, boys keep swinging from Lodger Bowie. Um, needles in the camel's eye from Here Comes the Warm Jets, which most of you will have heard in the Velvet Goldmine soundtrack and movie. And Microsoft, every mm -hmm. time you put on that little... Being an Apple man myself, of course. And me. Know. Are you? <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Um, do you receive royalties off that Microsoft thing? Oh, I wish I did. <laughs> really? It was just a buyout thing? Yeah. You, you just yeah, went splang just, and that was it. Can, yeah. we, can we hear that again, yeah. this great composition? A million office workers are freaking out <laughs> while listening to this show. <laughs> what happened? Uh, um, I, I was already switched off. But isn't that the most famous thing? I mean, you'll ever do. Probably that's the most widely circulated piece of music I've ever made, yeah. That's incredible. <laughs> this is Lemon from you too. <laughs> Irritatingly, he also did that. That's uh, <laughs> you too's Lemon. Um, how do you pick... The band, uh, and which bands do you keep going back to? You don't like to repeat, so which bands do you keep going back to? Well, I keep going back to you too, <laughs> obviously. Um, and I suppose I, I go back to them because I really like the relationship that I have with them. I like them very much as people. You know them as well. They're, mm. they're a great bunch of people. And the relationship seems to get better. And, um, you know, we, we are working together now on a quite different level of involvement than we were at the beginning so there's much less it's much less clear situation of producer and band it's very much more collaborative now but uh, in your diary you talk about things like writing to uh, tim booth from uh, james that are bono and and writing about new vocal strategies what are you talking mm. about i mean you know <laughs> i croak on the odd record or two and i was there totally baffled new vocal structures and strategies what are you, uh. what are you talking about well, you know, singers after a while can get into a rut, just like anyone else, you know. 
And uh, what would you do with Bob Dylan? If I had to, what work vocal with him, strategy would you recommend? I well, one thing he could try is um, increasing the thing that he does already. You know the way he sings in very short packages of words with long space. Long space. He could take that a little bit further, I think. You know, with vocal strategies, you can either say to people, "Do more of what you do anyway," make it almost to the point of ridiculous, or do the opposite of what you do anyway. Because either you want to break habits, or you want to turn them into something like hyper habits. You know, something bigger than habits, something that become distinctive um, things in themselves. I, I'm I'm always worried when I hear singers falling into um, formulas, you know, like the way a lot of not very good singers end all their lines in a sort of kind of cheesy gospel way. That sort of thing. Yeah, but that's thing. too many notes, Mr. Mozart. Isn't yes, that's Mariah uh, Carey syndrome. Oh, well, that's my um, biggest comment to most people, too many notes. And I think Salieri was right as well. I've always thought that Mozart <laughs> got far too many notes in his music. But the, you see, there you are again. You're actually taking, let's say, Dylan and how you analysed his style was you put it into a sort of modular thing. You actually almost counted the syllables, mm -hmm. compressed them almost digitally in your own head, and you could see the whole thing forming. It's very cold. It's not that cold in the sense that... Um, you know, if I hear something I like, then all the strategies go out of the window, really. You you only have strategies to try to get you somewhere that, that is beyond explanation, you know. But Bono always sounds like Bono, doesn't he? Mm -hmm. I mean, give me an example of where uh, a strategy was tried and adhered to. Well, for example, I, I can't remember the song, but there's one song where I suggested singing right at the extremes of the register. I wish I could remember the song, that would help, wouldn't it? But so, so he moves between singing very low and very high. I will always love you, wasn't it? Maybe that one, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, another strategy might be to, um, to, you know, deliberately cut words short instead of slurring them into one another. Or to take a, conversa a conversational speaking pattern and make it melodic. Um, just things to move you to somewhere that you wouldn't necessarily go otherwise and of course if they only end up being exercises then there's no point in doing them mm. what, what's exciting about them is that if they suddenly tip you into a territory and you think wow this really is something beautiful and exciting and so then you just forget the strategies and you look at the territory and are the bands that you work with given that we, you, you said that you can't go back you can't repeat are they open enough to endlessly changing, um, let's say, Bowie, uh, you 2 James, for example? Well, that isn't the only thing I do with people. I don't, I don't only come in and try to upset their patterns. No, but you said that that's, that's the one thing that you can't, you personally can't go back and repeat mm -hmm. work you've done. I presume you're talking about work with not just your own, but other groups. Mm -hmm. um, it's, I don't really repeat with other people either. I, I like to... I like to think that every situation comes almost without a history, you know, let, let's act as if it's all new, let's act as if this is the first time, and of course it isn't, you, you can't help, and in fact you quite want to import a lot of things from the past, but um, it's, it's very thrilling to listen to everything with fresh ears, and I think one, one of the other things I do when I work with people is I give them a lot of confidence in their own ideas. Now. You know, it's very difficult for working on your own. Um, you come up with something and it looks always looks so clumsy at the beginning when it's a newborn idea compared to your triumphs of the past, you know, yeah. your legendary platinum albums and mm. Grammy-winning things and so on. And you have this new thing, it looks so unformed and clumsy. And I, I love new things and I love um, things in that early stage, so I, I just pour enthusiasm into them. And I think that really helps the process along. People don't abandon things so easily. Sort of like Dave Stewart, who... Well, he's brilliant at that as well, yes. He's, I think he's a, the great enthusiast, actually. A very nice person to have around if you're working. Mm. He was in here as well. Um, there's a question here from um, someone listening. 
Uh, Brian, how did Devo come to your attention? Was it Bowie who introduced you to them, and what attracted you to them? Am I right in thinking that you financed the recording of the Are We Not Men, while Warner Bros. and Virgin fought over the band in court? Finally, have you kept in touch with the band? Gosh, that's a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I, I met them in New York. I was, I think I'd just moved to New York at that time, in the late 70s. Um, they were playing there and causing quite a sensation because they had such a weird stage show. I mean, Devo were very much a visual band. And in fact, they were, in a sense, slightly before their time because they really depended on television. You know, if, if they had come out now in the MTV era sort of thing, with with the kind of sophistication of visual stuff they were doing they'd be very big now but they used to make videos which were absolutely brilliant but there was no there's no way you could see them you know no. occasionally something would get on television but the, anyway they were very very shocking i thought i'd never seen anything quite like them their stage thing was so developed and so well thought out um i saw them in cbgb's i think in new york and David was there as well. And he, we sat down at uh, dinner with him afterwards, and he said, why don't you produce them, Brian? <laughs> so I said, yeah, why don't I? To the band, you know. Yes, and then, indeed, I, I had a, a short period during which I could do that, because I was busy doing other things. So th none of the record companies would come up with the money to do the recording, so I, I financed it. And... It took about 20 years to get paid back. <laughs> it took about 20 minutes to make. I don't know if you were paying for it. You know, that's, here's a fiver, let's make a record. <laughs> Actually, where we made that was interesting. We made it in the studio of Connie Plank. And really? Connie Plank was, you know, one of the fathers of the whole German yeah. scene, the whole German, what became disco, actually, in, in some respects. <laughs> X of M should play Devo's version of the Stone Satisfaction to let everyone know what on earth Devo were all about. Did you produce this? Yes. Yeah. What was the? Did they have um, the sort of start at the beginning, cut up the whole thing, and start again attitude, or was that yours? Oh uh, no, they they were. It was actually very difficult working with them because they were so totally absolute about what they wanted, and this took the form of. You know, they arrived with this huge packing crate full of demos that they'd made, you know, a cassette recorded in a garage somewhere and a, a, a B-side that they'd released four years before on a little label in Akron, Ohio, and mm -hmm. so on and so on. They would pull one of these things out and say, now we want the snare drum sound like that. And then they'd pull another one out and we'd say, we want the bass sound like that. <laughs> it, was, it was really hard. This is the sound of pulling teeth. Bizarrely to him, we're with one of the most influential um, men in late 20th century pop music. I don't think he knows it, um, but we are, and it's very interesting for us. It's Brian Eno. You've been listening to most of the music he's actually made or produced or been involved in some way. And after the ads, we'll be back on XFM with some of the records he wants to play. We're back. Brian Eno here. Um... I want to read this stuff off the, off the email here, Brian. Um, I'd like to know why he's done so much work with James. It seems to me that most of the artists he's worked with, you two, Bowie, talking as John Cale, etc., will go down in history as great innovators, but I can't see James ever being described as anything other than... Uh, what does that say? Then same nice... Some nice, if not slightly dated pop. Some nice, if not slightly dated pop. Is there something Eno sees in them that I don't? Obviously there is. <laughs> I've, I've always liked them. The first thing I ever heard by them, I really paid attention to. And I mean, it is pop music, but um, is that bad? <laughs> you know, a lot of the things I'm, I would choose to play on a radio show like this could be described as pop music. And uh, the funny thing about pop is that it sounds better as time goes by, whereas the funny thing about experimental music is that it usually sounds worse. It sounds no. older, though, doesn't it, experimental music? Because as it comes around yeah. into the mainstream, you just think, well, so what? Yes, it sounds like a less good version of what's going on now, usually, when, right. when experimental music gets co-opted, as it were. But, you know, if, if somebody had said to you in the early 70s, you know, 
people are all going to be listening to ABBA in the 90s, you would have laughed, wouldn't you? Nobody would have imagined. I think ABBA were shite, and I've always thought they were <laughs> shite, and I can't <laughs> stand this sort of uh, uh, recidivist view, or whatever it's called. Um, you know, it's just um, dire. I think the production's awful, I think the melodies are lame, I think the voices are crap. McCluskey's going mad here, because that's what McCluskey <laughs> spends on his rave nights out, or whatever, <laughs> or plays. But uh, I'd have believed it, because, you know, we are well into irony. Disco is nothing but irony, in mm. fact, you know. Mm -hmm. So I'd have believed it in the great uh, moments of irony like now. But um, the point about James is that, you know, it's a, it's a, I think it is a good point. These are great innovators, the other people. And, but you just work with James because you like their music and you like them, I presume. I like their music a lot. And I, I think they will... Well, first of all, I think they are innovators as well, in, not in a technical sense, perhaps. You know, they don't, they don't do especially different things with instruments or technology or anything like that. But, but I think emotionally there, there is an innovation in what they do, in that they put together emotions that aren't usually put together you know this I, I always like this tension between bittersweet and um, sincerity and irony and the different things that can be mixed together I mean you said in the diary you said uh, the last thing or one of the few things pop music is about in fact is music yeah that's one of the last things it's about yes <laughs> that's what I said I think yeah it's you know if if you um, actually sat down and did a musicological analysis of pop music and you thought that that was all there was to it, the musical structure or the formation of melodies or so on, you'd say, well, it's a completely traditional and uninteresting kind of music. What's, what's interesting about it is the whole set of phenomena around it, you know, the whole ideas of lifestyle that get absorbed and spat out again by it, and the way it works as a sort of digestive process for the culture. I think I think it is musically original, but not in classical music. Terms. What do you mean by that? How it works is it a, a digestive process for the culture? Well, it, I think it's always been the centre of a sort of conversation. You know, it's a way of it's a way that people can develop a shorthand for things they like and believe in, and attitudes they want to hold and attitudes they don't want to hold. You know, you reject certain musics because they represent things that you don't want to belong to. So you can you can define your position by what you have allegiance to and what you um, dis despise, actually. But, I mean, by definition, pop music is ephemeral. It's represented clearly in the charts. You like one thing and then you don't. And then, I suppose, it's why you like it, because, again, the restlessness, the churn... Well, except that it turns out not to be ephemeral, you know. It's very interesting now that... that um, I don't know if you know this label called Rhino Records, who are doing sort of... Rico pop, or Rhino? Rhino? No, Rhino. Yeah, I do. They do kind of pop archaeology. So yeah. they, they've just released a whole CD which documents the recording of Great Balls of Fire by Jerry Lee Lewis. You hear all the conversations in the studio um, as Jerry Lee Lewis... Um, well, so he doesn't want to do it because he's, he's afraid can't he's... Do this. It's the devil's yeah. music. And, and, you know, you hear the drummer losing his temper and flinging the sticks onto the snare drum and walking out of the room. It's like the Trogs tape, isn't it, really? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, those moments in pop music, which um, I'm sure at the time, I mean, I remember thinking, yeah, this will last for a couple of years and that's it. <laughs> but they don't. They've lasted a long time and, in fact, they've become bigger in a way. They've become encrusted with more and more... I'm not sure the Great Balls of Fire and those mean anything. And I think probably justifiably to people now. They play it, but it is archaeology. Yeah, but it, exactly, it is that. But archaeology isn't unimportant. We're going to play you know. some of the stuff you've chosen, which bears on everything we talked about just now. In fact, it's probably the purest form of pop music. It's simple vocalisation mm -hmm. and melody and harmony, doo-wop. And throughout your diaries, the only music that you consistently refer to the most unlikely for you is do what music. In fact, that's what you seem to dance around with your kids at home to only. Yeah, yeah. Do up is really the source for me. Why? I mean, aside from the fact that you looked like a crazed do up on acid and the Roxy <laughs> Music albums, and we'll come to that later. Um, <laughs> why? Why that? Um, I don't know. I suppose it's partly because it's the the first music that I woke up to. I heard the first doo-wop song I ever heard when I was seven. It was called Get a Job by the Sirens. Get a Job. Yeah, yeah, you know. And uh, I 
I just love and you that still song haven't. So you didn't take I, the I message never, to yes, heart. I <laughs> yes, I never got never got one. Um, but I I then became completely fascinated by doo wop and I sing, so I could I would learn all the parts and be able to sing them. But I, I guess what I liked about it was it was basically a music that absolutely anybody could do. Doo wop has no unless you had a voice. Well, you do need a voice, but in fact, as you as you know, a lot of doo-wop singers didn't even have that. Wow. <laughs> um, so it was a it was a music that had really no, there were no entry qualifications whatsoever, and I think that's sort of been a defining characteristic of pop music. That's one of the really good things about pop music that it kind of invites all sorts of talents in uh, by not by not uh, prescribing a level of technical virtuosity. Classical music can't do that, for example. It, nor can jazz, actually. They both exclude by requiring technical virtuosity. So you're a Democrat. <laughs> you're very new Labour in the <laughs> musical area. <laughs> the dreamer is no obligation. So if you were wondering where Low and uh, Zeropa and <laughs> Laid and Diva all came from, it was there. And uh, uh, of course, everyone, everyone um, has their Marley thing. Mm -hmm. um, and you picked the one with the best bass line uh, from Kaya, uh, The Sun Is Shining. I mean, it, it's almost impossible actually not to like uh, uh, some form of doo-wop or organic pop, if you like, mm. or rock, mm. and uh, Marley fits in there, doesn't he? Was he the only genius to come out of reggae, do you think? Oh, no, Lee Perry. Lee Perry is, is really the man for me, but um, his Have you got Treasures of the Lost Ark? Yes. Oh, yes. We've been playing that non-stop. Yeah, here. yeah, no, he's, he's the guy f for me. Um, he's completely uh, mad, though. I yeah, mean, you're bad, is. but like he's <laughs> a complete loon. You know? <laughs> I mean, you should actually make a record with him. God, what would that be like? I'd love to, you know. I really would. I think it would be something... Well, it would certainly be wild, anyway. And you could go around with an electric fire. What was that? What, what's that picture? <laughs> Didn't you ask him why he's got an electric fire on his head? What did he say? I'm talking to Devoy now, who knows these things. Devoy. toaster. What? Oh, he's yeah. Because I'm a toaster. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he literally is mad, isn't he? Oh, yeah. He, he's, he's in Switzerland now, isn't he's, he? Yeah, he lives with a Swiss woman. So maybe David could shack up with them. That'd be an interesting <laughs> one, you know, the three of you guys. <laughs> I remember the first record of his I ever heard in 1973 was this thing called Bucky Skank, uh. which was so unbelievable. There was, like, huge spaces in it. I'd never heard such big spaces in a record. You know, ding, ding, ding. But da, 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 <laughs> just these long pauses where you were where all you heard was up. vinyl <laughs> crackling, you know. Um, and I remember playing that to some uh, English music journalists who later, of course, became stoned out uh, reggae fans. <laughs> I remember playing it to them and they were completely baffled by it. They really didn't get it at all. I thought it was the most amazing thing I'd ever heard. It made minimalism, you know, the whole American minimalist movement, look very uninteresting. So did you play comparison. this to any of your uh, pop contemporaries, like the Roxies or any of the other people? Yeah, yeah. Now, I, what, did, the, did they get the plot? Well, everyone knew it was something... See, because there new. was going on. I mean, like, people like who later became the Clash or the Pistols yeah. or, in our case, uh, the Rats, though, not put myself with that a lot. I'm just saying that we w began listening to that stuff simply because there was very little else to adhere to mm -hmm. uh, that had passion and rhythm mm -hmm. and something to say for itself. Yeah. So you were, you, you were pushed in that direction, either back to R&B, which was rhythmic and had something to say, or to something newer, which was rhythmic and had something to say, reggae. Yes, and I think, I think the other thing was that it was such a radical difference from what was going on in white pop music at the time. Because this was the time when the the era of multitrack, you know, when people were just piling on the instruments and everything was getting thicker and denser and... Also, glam was kind of over then. It had, it's yeah, hurrah yeah. was kind of over, wasn't yeah. it? Well, and you course, were coming to things like the, the stylistics and the Philadelphia sound, which was dire. Yes, that's right. Well, certainly there was a, a strong feeling that it would be nice to have a bit of space in music again. Mm -hmm. And suddenly hearing this stuff, which was practically all space, you know, there was hardly anything going on. Three instruments that hardly ever played and a voice that hardly ever sung. Um, 
glued together by the scratches on the record, you know. It was really something different at the time. Why pick um, The Sun Is Shining? Because you like it? Uh, well, I think the bass line on this is so obscure, and it's, it's a fantastic bass line. I think it's that guy, Family Man Barrett, isn't it? Aston Family Man Barrett, <laughs> which is also another reason for picking it. <laughs> it must be the best bass player's name <laughs> ever. Um, but the line is just an endless line that keeps unfolding. That's the vibe with reggae anyway. I mean, not, what's that one, um, Stirred It Up? It's just the bass line. Doom. Yeah. Famous bass lines that we can recite. Go on. Laid, James. Um, see? I said to you that was what's <laughs> it? Uh, see, yeah. Uh, I said to you that that must have been uh, a song that you know was fully formed when it came in, and you said not so, Squire. No, Why? no. This that song has a very interesting story. Um, you know, the way James composes by standing in a room and playing for hours and hours, and then they listen back to what they've been doing, which goes through all sorts of journeys and includes fully formed lyrics that appeared at the moment on the spur of the moment. Um, and they go back and they find little bits and turn them into songs, basically, you know, make repetitions of them and so on. And uh, they did that one day, and I was listening back to one of the tapes, and I found a tiny little four-bar fragment, which was the beginning of this song. And I drew it to their attention, and everybody liked it. And this recording is the first time they ever played it as a song... <laughs> So it never existed for this very recording. It, it never, there was never a second take. They played it. And lyrically. And, and, and lyrically, it was done in one... Uh, it was made up on the spot. Cool. He's, he's a very interesting lyricist like that because he comes out with whole paragraphs of stuff which just come from nowhere, it seems. You know, they're not pre-written. I mean, he does also write lyrics, but a lot of his best lyrics come out as improvisations. It's really unusual to see that, to see not but just a line, but Bowie whole. does that, doesn't he? Yes, he does, but not um, not quite so much. I mean, Tim Booth is re has really a gift for that, um, for delivering whole chunks of stuff um, from the top of his head. Hmm. I think, yeah, I think you're wrong about them as a band. I think they're really good. It wasn't me who said it. It was. Oh, sorry, whoever it was. Geezer on the email. <laughs> Geezer on the email. Listen again. Yeah, you said that, um, again, I go back to something you wrote. You were talking about um, bands um, that often the style, the band exists simply for the style, uh, mm -hmm. that the music is absolutely academic and good. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's one, of the, that's one of the possibilities in pop music, isn't it? You know, there's always a... How much of that was Roxy? Well, we wanted to... We certainly want to reinvent that idea, you know, because the the late 60s and early 70s, music had become terribly sort of earnest and, um, you know, post-psychedelic music and the era of, you know, multi-track, the orchestral sort of era of pop music was pretty pompous in a way, and it was very, it was very much... Um, well, it was, we, it was we just post-Beatles. Yes, sort of, we are serious composers, and in fact, we're, what we're doing is so artistic that we don't really even look at the, have to look at the audience, you know. Mm -hmm. It was very much people playing with their backs to the audience as if they were in a world of their own. And we hated that, and we, want, we wanted really to revive show business, but, but in a sort of, I guess, a slightly arch way. And I suppose the, that period was the first time that pop music started looking back at itself and its own history and saying... Actually, we can use any of this. We can recycle it, you know, we can... Because a lot of the Roxy thing was quite retro as well. It was sort of retro and futuristic, you know. We had Elvis Presley hairstyles and leopard skin and lame, but then there was this futuristic overlay to it as well. And I, I suppose the, the image was of this future civilization, which was some kind of weird blend of our recent um, kitsch past and and the future that we didn't quite understand yet. 
But I mean, you just you just said that um, at the time there was a lot of pomp music where people, in effect, turned their back on the audience. But one of those bands I'm sure you must be referring to, say, is Pink Floyd, mm -hmm. who were in fact trying to do ambient music. In fact, were doing ambient music mm -hmm. uh, in in a way which you then came on to take just a step further. I mean, were you interested in what they were doing, or were they one of the people that you thought this is too much, this turning inward on yourself? I liked very much what they first did. The, the early Pink Floyd records I liked a lot and then, then I thought it became I just don't like it when things become classical you know, conceited and big and I thought it became too big um, it was very impressive technically you know, their stage shows were very impressive but they seemed to me um, to have nothing to do with the thing that always thrills me most which is economy you know, I love it when people produce a big effect with very small means. Um, that's why I like doo -wop, I guess, because it's the most, it's the cheapest music you can make. And yet it strikes me emotionally as very powerful. Um, one of the questions that someone sent in was your falling out with Brian Ferry in the early Roxy days, similar to the falling out with David Byrne and Talking Heads years later. That is, this town ain't big enough for the both of us. Or did David Byrne yourself just grow musically incompatible? Well, so I didn't, start I with didn't, the Roxy Music question. Yes, I, well, I didn't fall out with David Byrne, so uh, I, in a way I can't make a comparison there. No, Brian and I fell out, and I, I'm not surprised, really, you know, when you have two big egos in one band. Plus you were bald and you had lots of hair. <laughs> the baldness <laughs> photographed well. <laughs> how, did you do the, how did you do the Elvis thing? I mean, you know, you're wearing this ridiculous sort of thing. I mean, were, were you going bald at that point? I've, I've always been going bald. <laughs> <laughs> it's a state of being. I was, you were I was William Hague when you were bald. five. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've, I've never been very hirsute. <laughs> <laughs> and and I've never been worried about it. I think probably my biggest achievement in pop music is to be the first musician to willingly and uh, welcomingly go bald. With feathers on your head, With fact. feathers, yes, and not, not to get hair transplants, well, not it, to it, get those little quiffs that cover the bald bits well, or anything like that. You see, that. if you'd been fat as well, you would have invented rap music. <laughs> 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 um, the uh, What happened, I mean... I mean, did they take to your noodling around, which is what it must have been? I mean, 68 time you were messing around with tapes and making loops, but mm -hmm. so were the Beatles. Mm -hmm. I mean, were you picking up on what they were doing or did you just ignore it? Were you just, as a non, in inverted commas, musician, just messing around with this potential? Well, I loved tape recorders. I thought tape recorders were just the most exciting things because they, they allowed you to do something with sound. You could take sound out of the air and suddenly it became substance and you could cut it up and turn it backwards and all that sort of thing and I was endlessly fascinated by that. Is it apocryphal that, you know, when you were seven and you got a tape recorder, the first sound you, you recorded was a, a pen on a lampshade or something? <laughs> That's right. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, it was, I was You precocious, seven, bold I was, I was older than that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, what... When you came along, well, I didn't I mean, have you got any instruments. You That's why I did it. The only thing I had that made a noise was this big metal lampshade. That was cool. So I, I recorded it and slowed it down so it sounded like a huge. What age bell. were you? Oh, I was 16. Um, it was 1964, so yeah. You, you get into a train carriage, and in the train carriage is Andy Mackay. Mm -hmm. And you've said that if you got into the other train carriage, if the train had just stopped a little further along. Yeah, I would have had a different life. Yeah. It's mad, isn't it? Well, that, isn't that funny, though? That's how lives are, I think. You just... One little uh, twist at one moment in time, it sends you off in a completely different direction. So when you went along, Andy said, this guy that messes around with stuff, and yeah. presumably Brian was the guy in the band. Yeah. Uh, what did you do? Oh. Well, initially I went to a Roxy rehearsal because they wanted some demo tapes made. And I had tape recorders. I'd been collecting them for years. <laughs> and I had loads of them. Um, so I went along to help them make a demo tape. Well, in the um, place they were recording was a was a synthesizer, and nobody really had much idea how to use it. Was it one of those sort of telephone exchange sort of yes. pluggy in things? Yeah, that sort of thing. It was it was a very sweet thing, actually, a very nice looking little machine, which nowadays um, 
would sell for five or six thousand dollars, you know, <laughs> and still doesn't sound any better than it did then, I must say. But um, I started fiddling around with that, and it's, it became a feature of the band, you know. I used to take the other players' instruments and feed them through the synthesizer and then mutate the sound in And they were ways. totally up for that? Completely. It, it gave us a sound that nobody else had. You know, we, we could do things on stage that people were only just beginning to do in the studio on records, but we could actually do them live. And it really became a part of our sound, I think. Let's listen to some of that. You wanted to hear, you chose, uh, we gave you the choice, you chose Beauty Queen for, um, for, for your pleasure, isn't it? Yeah. Beautiful song, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we were talking about that Roxy signature, chuck, 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 chuck. Yeah, which we took from the Velvet Underground. We, we were very keen on the Velvet Underground, and I think partly because we, we sort of identified with them because they seemed also to come from this kind of fine art background, <laughs> deciding to take pop music as a medium, you know, because they had this whole Andy Warhol charisma behind them. Yeah. And uh, Kale, of course, had been through a... A classical music education. Well, it's a standard British school, isn't it? I mean, you you, you go into art school, uh, you pick up all sorts of influences, and you pump it back out through guitars, and yeah. in your case, synths. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I mean, it's an unacknowledged fact that art schools produce about 14 times as many musicians as painters, really. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, the, I mean, isn't that because in, in pop music in Britain, uh, in, in America it's always been a singular style with its basis largely in R&B. Yeah. Uh, I mean, old-style R&B. And um, you basically have check shirt and jeans, whereas mm -hmm. over here it's a complete cultural package. You don't just get the band, you get cute in the shape of the Beatles mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. you know, sod off in the shape of the Stones. And then there's a fashion thing to go with it and yeah. usually a movie thing to go with it. Let's say the whole punk experience is a classic example. And in, in your case with the glam thing, mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't just, there was a whole art thing that went with, wasn't there? Oh, yeah. It was, it was a completely band together group of things. I mean, it... It started, in a way, with The Who, is, I is think. Is that why pop music in Britain is almost automatically more powerful than uh, other European uh, forms of pop or American forms of pop, which I think it is, anyway? Yes, I think it is, too. And I, th I think it is because, first of all, it absorbs talents from all sorts of areas that probably wouldn't get into pop music in those other places. Um, and it um, it's, it influences all of, all of those areas as well. It spills over its boundaries all the time. Well, no, like nobody the, can keep it in place, you know. Well, like the White Album is Richard Hamilton, who yes. in turn taught Brian. Yes, exactly. Who in turn comes out through the other stuff in Roxy. Well, and, uh, you know, I, I studied under a group of teachers who previously had taught The Who, or... or Peter Blake and those. Um, well, Roy Ascot. Oh, yeah. yeah, Blake was, was among them as well. Um, so... And I, in fact, I remember my in my first month at art school, you know, I turned up there with all my paints, expecting to be a painter. <laughs> and your tape recorders. <laughs> <laughs> and the um, head of the college came running in, holding a single, which was the Who's first single. I can't explain. And he said, "You all should listen to this." <laughs> I thought this was really something, you know. But, I mean, we isn't, isn't that fantastic? School. I mean, here's, like, you know, the, the cultural elite of this country, the politicians, etc., you know, decrying um, the schools and, and the art schools. And, in fact, you know, one of the biggest industries, money earners and uh, culturally recognisable countries in the late 20th century came about because these teachers were mad for pop music. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, if, if anybody did an actual, you know, cost analysis of the whole thing... They would have to say that art schools are a very, very good investment in this country. You know, what else does England have to sell? The only thing we make, actually, is culture. We don't make ships anymore, and we don't produce any more coal or anything like that. We're not good at many other things, but we're very, very good at culture, I think. And it's partly because we don't have... Um, we have very porous boundaries between different areas, you know, so people can keep cross-fertilizing in, in um, fruitful ways. What happened between you and Brian in the end? Uh, what do you call the end? When, when you said, I've had it, I'm off. Oh, I, I left the band. I mean, there was, there was quite a lot of bad feeling, but 
actually it didn't persist for that long and why th- why what 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 was that for what was the bad feeling yeah. about? i think it was just competitiveness you know um i i got a lot more attention probably than i should have given my position in the band you know i wasn't i wasn't that important <laughs> in the making of the music but i i was important in the image of the band i guess and perhaps in this connecting it with this sort of space age thing that was a part of Roxy but you know Brian was definitely the songwriter there were you shaggy more babes I was yes <laughs> then fairy <laughs> yes and well, you're, you're mad for shagging though aren't you not anymore no yes you are yes you are you've got now. a massive <laughs> porn collection haven't you no that's not true is it not no this is one of those myths in Q magazine do you want me to Q, start Q writing magazine do you want me to start myths do you want me to start <laughs> rifling through your diary? I will pick at random. Well, you can, yes. Where there are massive <laughs> entries about bottoms, porn you like. Let me see. I've done these. Uh, here we go. Here we go. By the way, this is not my. One of he the hasn't frust- just nicked my diary from my bedside table. One of the frustrations <laughs> of life is never finding precisely the pornography you want. Well, it's true, isn't it? Extraordinary <laughs> that sex, sex fun is so hard to get. I mean. You should be able to advertise man seeks position as sofa for large lady and gets lots of sensible replies, for example. Well, you should, shouldn't you? No, you like, you like arses, large ones, and you like smells. <laughs> yes, you're... You shouldn't say those two things in the same Well, sentence. why? You're always talking about <laughs> fart food. Let me just look up here my little <laughs> subtext. You keep, giving, you keep giving menus in this diary about how to create the most obnoxious dinners that will set you... <laughs> set you f- off and then you go on about <laughs> noses you want to start you want to write a book about flemish noses don't you which we've discovered we both share yes we, we do we bob bo- said at the beginning of the program that we had nothing in common but it turns out we're both flemish yes it does <laughs> and you you go rapturously on about someone's absolute nosiness just the rapture of a large nose which i'm proud to say that I, i'm not proud to say that my nose is actually the nearest point of the planet to the sun <laughs> But um, it does go all on this sort of olfactorial sense and bottoms. And let me read you this this disgusting menu, <laughs> if I can find it. Flatulent dish. That's your words. 20 cloves of roasted garlic turned into a paste, mixed with pureed carrots and pumpkin oil, served with artichokes and kohlrabi. Look forward to a day of fragrant farting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Pete Paquette is here giving a big thumbs up. Well, yes, you see, I mean, this is the kind of recipe that people can't get in a Delia Smith book. You know? <laughs> Thank God. I, I think that's useful information. But what is it? You're in, you, are into, you are into porn because there's several references, and basically you think every woman looking at you throughout this is totally mad for you, that you keep giving them leering <laughs> smiles as they happen to glance <laughs> in your direction. Well, you are a shadow, aren't true, you? really. <laughs> I mean, was there mad shagging going on with Roxy in that? Mm, yes. <laughs> At some points, yes, there was, yeah. Um, yeah, I was very active for a while, but then I collapsed my lung in, in a particularly passionate 24-hour <laughs> <laughs> feast. That, that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I gave up then for a while. Listen, before, um, at the end of this show, I want you to actually record... Uh, a recipe for us because you like cooking don't you mm-hmm. I uh, do. and you've got the most exotic menus here and i i particularly want the brian eno xfm farting recipe <laughs> <laughs> that we can <laughs> that we can access on the net here going to this guy's <laughs> second part of his question about um david byrne um you know how did you what connected you with them and he says here did um did you fall out with him as well no i didn't fall out um there was there was a little bit of difficulty between myself and the rest of the band because when I had worked with them on two albums already and then the third one um, 
became very much a collaboration between David and I. We had just done that other record, My Life in the Bush of Ghosts, which was just the two of us together. Um, then when we went, went into the third Talking Heads album, we just carried on working together in a way. And it, it did sort of s exclude the band somewhat. But um, not to any bad effect, I think. I mean, the record that came out was good, and um, they liked it too. And they did have quite a lot to do with it, but definitely I was part of the band by that time. So that, that perhaps overstepped a, a line that they want to maintain. But there wasn't, there wasn't like years of bad feeling or anything about it. I mean, it's weird. You do work with two types of people, it seems to me. You work with a sort of sterile modernism, an art sort of thing, which would be David, or David Bowie and David Byrne. And then you work with highly emotional type of music, very la panoramic, like U2 or James. Mm -hmm. um, Devo would be part of the former. Um, and... I don't... To I tell mean, you the truth, I don't see that distinction as being so clear. I know you don't, because Bowie's music is very emotional, so mm -hmm. are David Burns. But mm -hmm. they analyse, there's an analytical quality yes. to it that has a sort of cold centre that makes you stand back from it objectively as opposed to being, being embraced by it, like, mm -hmm. like the, uh, the U2 thing. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, I, I think that... They, they, they're self-conscious in a way about what they're doing, but, but actually you 2 are as well. Um, I think really it comes down to taste. You know, you two want to make the kind of music they make, not because they don't have a choice. It's but did, not, it's didn't not they sort they of go? Think of any other way of doing it in a mass consumer way. Didn't they slightly go off a bit when they went into this mass irony? Let's say pop, pop yeah, album. I, th I think so they, they became did. too analytical about yeah. who they were and yeah. where they were going. Yeah. Well, Whereas uh, Bowie doesn't go wrong on that sort of thing. Usually, usually no. he's got a fairly true touch. Um, certainly, he does in his singing. Though, though I think musically he he makes that mistake as well. You know, one of the problems with modern recording is that it's very easy to make something that sounds pretty much like music very quickly, you know, with a few samples True. and sequences and Absolutely, so on. Yeah. In a morning you can have something that sounds like it's almost a finished song, yeah. but actually the song isn't started yet, you know. It doesn't have a vocal yet. You think, oh, well, we'll think of something later. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think what happened with pop was they got very excited about the kind of musical landscapes they were making, the rhythmic landscapes. And then it was it was left to poor Bono to come up with something to sing over it. And that's a very hard way round for people to work, I think. The rhythmic landscapes are frankly ten a penny. Yeah, they are now. It's so easy to make them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, you but, get but you David then of David loops. Bowie fell into the mistake of uh, you know this 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 wall of sound, the metal machine music type yeah. thing. This you know thing with very little musical content, musical mm. for it to come as or something to say. Um, do you think that he missed you in, in those sort of, in, in in that instance with the Tin Machine instance? Um, he's never said that he did. <laughs> I don't know really. I think I think again that was something he wanted to do. But I I feel that um, it was crap, wasn't it? Yeah, I don't like it very much, and and I think it was, it was undisciplined, really, you know. And I think he his strength has always been a certain kind of discipline, actually. Even even if you listen to his earliest records, they they're very very clear in terms of their organisation and structure. You know, they're they're beautifully crafted things. You know, even if you think of Major Tom, that's a real piece of craftsmanship, apart from being a great song. Mm. There's no fact. Life on Mars know. is amazing, yeah. the construction of that. Where, where did David Bo Byrne go off of? Um, when he went into his world music exploration mm, stuff? Well, I wouldn't say with either of those people that they've gone off. And I, I mean, who am I to say whether people have gone off or not? Um, I, th I think what happened with David Byrne was that he he missed the situation of being in a band although he was the dominant figure in talking heads it very much was important that he had those other three people there as his sounding board and and as people who would prepare a kind of um a situation that he could step into as a singer which they knew he would like and he would respond to 
and it's much harder if you're pushing the whole snowball yourself you know and the musicians you're talking to are probably slightly in awe of you anyway they've been hired they don't quite know what to do and they don't know how to introduce ideas um, there's such a hierarchy in a situation where you're the boss and you've hired these other people mm. whereas within a band of course everyone flings their ideas in and they either survive or don't and there might be there might be an internal hierarchy in the band but it's still people learn ways of infiltrating their ideas you know I mean you too is a very good example of a band that doesn't um, uh, doesn't fall into a lot of those traps, those working traps. It's a sort of collective, isn't it? They yeah. call themselves the commune or something, not the commune, what is it? The commentary, or Bono, Bono refers to it, yeah. eyes raised. Yeah. Um, here's an example of David Bowie when he had that sound, or David Byrne when he had that sounding uh, board, Life During Wartime. <laughs> Uh, we're back and it's uh, the chill and it's a little later than usual and I hope you're not bored. Um, it's pretty obvious that we're not. Um, we're with a very interesting person, if you just tuned in, Brian Eno, and we're basically trawling through his brain and his life. Um, the chill is obviously all his music because XFM could in fact play 24 hours of his records, I think, without repeating anything. Um, so if you're on the Why way home... You? What? Why don't you? Because you get paid too much, Eno, and has sod off. <laughs> I need it. <laughs> He's the man who wrote the Microsoft thing. Do you know how much he got for that? 35 grand, correct? Dollars. Dollars. Not, not even pounds. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> um, so every time you turn on your PC, Mr. Eno. Um, <laughs> if you're on your way home uh, or heading down to the tube, this is good stuff. Um, this is the person who invented all this chill out stuff, who actually found uh, that space in your mind that um, we possibly all need to get to, especially in the frazzled part of the day that this is. Uh, starting off with Not Yet Remembered from the LP, The Plateau of Mirrors. Uh, what's that, 1980 about? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. And then um, Harold Budd, Brian Eno. What's that? Harold Budd was a... He, he was a pianist, or is, is a composer from right. the sort of minimalist um, school, Californian minimalism. Right. He sent me a demo tape. I and loved it. <laughs> Pale Blue Eyes, The Velvets. You chose that in Desert Island Disc, didn't you? That's right. Yeah. 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 Um, Deep Blue Day from the Train Spotting soundtrack right. and ending with Another Green World. And there's a question here from someone listening. And let me just find it because there's so many emails and things firing. Me. With all the current interest in UFOs and alien phenomena, do you think mankind will ever find another green world? Um, I have to say that I have no interest in UFOs and alien phenomena in, in the sense that there, there seems to be so much to look at on this planet that I don't really bother with scanning the skies that much. Um, another green world really was not necessarily um, another place, it was another mental place I suppose. You all know that anyway. More familiar is the arena theme. You probably didn't know that Brian wrote that. Brian Eno, Another Green World, Deep Blue Day from the Train Spotting soundtrack. Sounded a bit scratchy there for some reason, but it sounded like an old vinyl track to me. Cool. <laughs> Pale Blue Eyes, The Velvets. Uh, Brian's favourite uh, Velvet Underground album, in fact, and he doesn't have it because yeah, you're yeah. afraid, aren't you? I, well, I've never owned it. I I love that record so much. that, In fact, it's my favourite album, I would say, if I had to choose one really? single album of all time. Yeah, but I had never wanted to get tired of it, so so I never owned a copy. So whenever I hear it, it's it's really charmed. Like and just now, it was very difficult carrying on a conversation while that was playing. You know, I find it so commanding that music. Not yet remembered from the LP, the Plateau of Mirrors. That it's a very cool and extended chill from the chill meister himself, um, <laughs> which. Um, I've been quoting from your published diary in case anyone thinks I swiped it from your <laughs> bedside table. And um, it, for someone who's 
had so much to do with contemporary music and for stuff that just appears in the background of our lives, whether it be at meat counters and supermarkets or and television themes or um, in our offices or homes through the PC. Um, you're very English. For a paddy like myself, you're <laughs> quintessentially English. And, and in fact, English Catholic in that you've got that rebellious thing going on. But... Um, are you, do you like being English? Are you glad you're English? I do like being English. I, I think being born in the uh, world language is, is a big plus, you know. It is the sort of lingua franca of the world at the moment. Well, are you one of those English people who do the country down? Which I know, I've got an immigrant's view of this place. So no, I'm, a, I'm eternally I'm, grateful to it for letting me yeah, breathe, you know. Yeah. And, uh, but you say things here. Now, um, these are snatches. Um, you describe yourself irritatedly uh, in a moment of depression as so English and so analytical, like Radio 2. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, of course, it's annoying. You know, I spend a lot of time with people, well, as you know, Irish people, and, and I, I like the, um, the softness of the attitude they have, actually. It's... I mean, soft in the sense of soft-edged, you know, it's not, it's not so cut and dry. Yeah, I quoted Shane McGowan's dad back to him, who said, um, the Irish are essentially a lawless people, which is why we're free. Mm -hmm. And you well, seem, you like the structure, you like reason, you I, like... I do like it. I think, I think there's really a place for it, and I'm, I'm good at using it, and, you know, but I also recognise the limitations. I, I remember that thing Seamus Heaney said when he got the... Nobel Prize, they said, so Mr. Heaney, what's it like being famous now? And he said, oh, well, all Irish people are famous. <laughs> and I, I kind of like that attitude of mind, and I wish we had a bit more of that. Yeah, but then you say, uh, self-deprecatingly, of course, um, you feel yourself sometimes ruined by the diversion of faint success. Surely not. I mean, we've listened to two hours. We've gone on. Mm -hmm. We've got endless emails and questions that we can't possibly answer. Well... Is that the way you view <coughs> yourself? I mean, it's, yes, it's I, pathetic. I <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm very sorry you feel that way. <laughs> Ruined it's a, it's by the diversion of faint success. Yeah, it's, beautifully it's a small phrased. heap. You know, it's it's not the whole world. That's all I keep remembering. You can, you know, you can be in this business, and uh, it can seem like it's everything, but it isn't really very much. You know, it's it's just music. It's just art or whatever. There's a whole world of human affairs and people getting massacred and dying of starvation and so on. So, we we ought to retain a little bit human. Well, I know you do, but not not all of us retain a s humility about what. The, the relevance of what we're doing might be. But, I mean, you know, I'll use the Father Jack um, euphemism here. You constantly say, what the feck <laughs> am I here for? <laughs> constantly. I mean, it comes back and again, and then mm. you sort of move on. Mm -hmm. uh, isn't it obvious? Not at all obvious to me. No, since I, you know, I, I don't think there's any... Um, purposeful authority i haven't put been put here for any reason i just arrived here so it's up to me to work out what what i might be here for finally um uh, you knocked off a, i think a, a six or seven line poem um which you meant for something else but i thought it, it was a very good description of what you feel about yourself which the three of us here would demur from you said you were like a civil servant and uh, I think these are the last three lines, like a civil servant, a safe pair of hands, but always someone else's craft. Mm -hmm. Do you well, feel that that's, you're just a hired gun? That's it? That's, that's what producing sometimes feels like. You know, I, I said somewhere else in that that producing is a well-paid form of cowardice because actually you don't, in the end, you don't take responsibility for, for what goes out there. So it's easy to be very brave as a producer because actually it's the other people who get blamed, you know. Um... Yeah, so, but here's here's something. So periodically, I have to I have to remember to do something myself to remember what it feels like to actually expose yourself and put you on the line. Here's something that line. summed up practically everything you've done. You produced it, you um, co-wrote co it, and you played in the band. And it's of course Miss Sarajevo. And mm. um, I think it's apt that we end with that just before the news, and two days after, um, forty plus people 
were massacred in cold blood. Before we play it, I want you to read, because it's fantastic. Um, on the day you started this song, you walked into the studio and Bono was just there noodling about with some rough idea. Mm -hmm. And there's a great description and you weren't to know when you wrote this that this song would become so telling. So okay, if you could read I'll, that, I'll read and we'd say goodbye. And thanks very much, Brian. It was great. Okay, well, thanks a lot, really. So Bono starts to form the idea that this could be a song about being besieged, people trying to carry on doing ordinary things like playing piano and buying shoes while their city is being shelled. Interesting evolution of a vocal idea. He starts with a line that goes, is there time for cutting hair? This gradually moving into, is there time for this and that and the other, in his new list-making style of writing. Then I suggest that the other voices do the first half of each line. I'm thinking Motan. So Edge and I sing, is there a time? And Bono responds with the rest of the line. We do it again and again, alternating in various ways. Of course, Bono, being a natural-born singer, ends up filling every available space and sing over our bits as well, which I keep saying doesn't sound so good but which he just can't help doing. It doesn't sound so bad either, but singers are like Arabs. They abhor a vacuum, and a vacuum is defined as whenever I'm not singing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, shall I go on, or do you want to play? Yes, yes. I go on. But the result is really charmed, a misty, melancholy, bitter sweetness undercut by the sharpness of the setting, the Miss Sarajevo beauty contest, where a group of Bosnian artists and their girlfriends put on a kitsch beauty pageant while the Serbs were shelling them in Sarajevo. It's so straightforward working with them like this, no ego decisions, no politics. We think this may be the song for Pavarotti to sing on. He phoned again. <laughs> 